I'm hanging out here. Uh, I've uh, done the work at the BC uh, on the ATM, and I'm uh, hanging out on the side here by this uh, box. You want me to look over? You can see all the Great Lakes. See Detroit. See Windsor. Toledo. See the St. Lawrence River. Okay, for the ATM guide room, uh, there's a pretty bright spot over on the uh, very west limb here. It's uh, probably actually reaching seven or uh, three. In the months of August and September 1973, a second crew of astronauts lived and worked aboard the Skylab space station. During that two-month span, these men generated a staggering amount of scientific data. Data that in some cases will take several years to analyze, and whose impact the scientific world has yet to fully comprehend. For the record, it was the second manned mission of Skylab. But owing to overwhelming success, it might well be called a scientific harvest. July 28, 1973. Skylab, with well over a thousand Earth revolutions, begins its 75th day in orbit. Except for ground solar observations, its systems have been mostly silent for more than a month, having been powered down when its first tenants departed. Today, the slumbering space station will again be brought to life when the second crew arrives for an extended stay. Their journey will begin at Kennedy Space Center, Launch Complex 39, embarkation point for most of space history. Transportation for the flight is the two-stage Saturn 1B, which is well along in the pre-dawn countdown. Who's calling? Hydraulic pressure coming up on fin two. All right, stand by. Verify. In nearby launch control, the vigil is centered in firing room three, Here, the staccato of digital readouts tells the launch team that all systems are go. The countdown is smooth, almost routine. For the crew, the lectures, the briefings, the simulations, almost two years of intensive training is behind them. Today, they begin the real thing. Navy Captain Alan Bean, senior member of the crew, is Skylab commander. In November 1969, as lunar module pilot of Apollo 12, he walked on the moon. The science astronaut and civilian member is Owen Garriott. He brings to this mission a well-rounded background in science and engineering. The pilot, Marine Corps Major Jack Lausma, who served on support crews for three Apollo missions. For the three of them, the longest space flight ever is about to unfold. Let's get a lift off. We'll be looking for lift off right at the T zero mark. We passed the 15 second mark in the count. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. We have ignition sequence start. All ignitions, all ignitions are running, all engines running. We have a lift off. By all accounts, there had never been a smoother launch sequence. Rendezvous occurred just off the U.S. Pacific coast, almost eight hours following liftoff. Blowing in 
the breeze. Looks like about a 10 or 15 knot gale every time the uh, thrusters uh, fire in just a very gentle fly around here. Roger, uh, we were watching that very thing there. I think she'll probably uh, knock off the fly around at this point to avoid blowing that turret all the way. Skylab Houston, uh, we've taken a look at uh, both the CSM and the Swiss. They both look good. To go for docking, we're about a minute and a half from LOS. Roger. Okay, we're docked. Uh, that went real well. An oxidizer leak in one of the quad thrusters was the only blemish on an otherwise perfect flight. The leak would mean a slight loss in attitude control on the return flight, but at this point, it appeared to be well within backup control capabilities. Leaving the detailed analysis to ground specialists, the crew wasted no time moving into their temporary home. Within an hour, they had begun restoring Skylab to a living, working environment. Activation consumed the better part of the first week because not everything went according to plan. I uh, closed the circuit breaker on that beauty and uh, it popped open. And uh, so then I uh, turned the switch off and uh, closed the circuit breaker and then turned the switch back on and the circuit breaker popped open again. So uh, something's wrong with Mole's MB secondary fan. give you a feel where we are at the moment. Uh, we're beginning to eat our meal right now. We've had to move extremely slowly to uh, keep from uh, causing any uh, vestibular problems with ourselves by that. Uh, I think both uh, Owen and I have a little bit of stomach awareness, so we tend to uh, be fairly careful how we move. And since we are moving uh, rather slowly, then uh, it's taken uh, a little bit longer than we planned. Because of built-in mission flexibility, the delay had little impact on overall scientific gain. The flight plan was adjusted as required while the crew continued to make headway. The solar astronomy instruments were, meanwhile, delivering data in the unmanned mode. Medical experiments got underway. And some of the corollary science and student experiments were initiated. For example, these Minchmog minnows, being set up for observation, appeared to lose orientation in zero G. They would usually float with their belly toward the wall. And then after doing that for a while, they would be swimming outside loops again. So they can't make up their mind which way to stop it down either. Yes, sir. Good observation. Another passenger from Earth was Arabella the spider. This was a student experiment designed to find out the structure of the web she would spin in the weightless state. On mission day six, a second quad thruster indicated failure. Even so, command module control was still adequate for the return flight. However, the uncertainty of additional failure prompted an urgent decision. Hey, uh, Al, this is Chris Kraft. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, as far as the uh, RCS system is concerned, we uh, really can't determine at this particular moment whether we have a generic problem or whether we have some two unique problems with these uh, quads. Now, just to be prudent, however, we have started the uh, preparation of the vehicle at the cave on a uh, accelerated basis so that we would have a rescue vehicle uh, available to us should that become necessary. 
Okay, now, I guess in concluding, I'd like to say that further that we're proceeding here with uh, as if we're going to have a nominal mission. And if you feel like you've seen any further discussion on this thing, please feel free to call us in any way that you want to. John, uh, you just said the right words. We've been uh, hoping you'd say that all day, ever since we found out that uh, that was a true uh, problem that we had with our quads this morning. And we, uh, we agree 100% with what you just announced. Okay, so be it. So as a precaution, rescue plans were set in motion. Whether they would be carried out completely depended on assessment of the thruster problem, a problem that could now be fully explored. As the mission entered the second week, the crew stepped up the medical protocol, somewhat slighted up to now because of more pressing needs. We also have a way to measure our heart rate. If this reads out our heart rate, beats per minute as we're pedaling. Of course, the harder you pedal, or the harder your heart has to work, and the better it is for your cardiovascular heart system. While we're pedaling this bicycle during the medical experiment, our breath is analyzed in this metabolic analyzer so that our uh, pulmonary system can be thoroughly evaluated during the period that we're up here. This is used in combination primarily with the lower body negative pressure experiment. The man slides in from the top here. He slides into his waist. Then we pump him down to a semi-vacuum. That draws his blood from his head down into his legs. It's a good measure of how well his cardiovascular system is performing over long term in space flight. Of course, that's one of the reasons we're here. The purpose of the rotating chair is to determine the response of the vestibular system to zero gravity. And we've been doing many experiments on this to see how the balance mechanism in the inner ear is affected by weightlessness. Food log. EDR, four salt packs, and one strawberry drink. Other medical data was compiled from an accurate reporting of the daily food and fluid intake. Body waste and food residue were weighed daily. And the wastes were either dried or frozen for return to Earth for analysis. The weight of each crewman was also checked daily, not by conventional scales, but by a device that electronically counts time of oscillations of the subject to determine mass. And blood samples were taken. The samples were frozen and later returned for post-flight analysis. Okay, you rep to start, Jack. Tape motion is working. Let her fly out. Stand by for auto cal in three seconds. Two, Two, one. The Earth Resources Package was enabled. Its six remote sensing systems put into full operation. objectives in Skylab is to look at Earth and its resources. We want to look at its forestry and its agriculture, its freshwater resources, its weather, its uh, pollution, and a number of, of other resources that are uh, very important to us on the Earth. This is called our Earth Resources Experiment Package. It consists of uh, about uh, six experiments with which we uh, look at the Earth, and we spend a lot of time taking data here. This particular instrument is a telescope. And we can uh, see a uh, resolution down to a quarter of a mile square. For example, we can see a city block with this telescope. Just take a shot off the coast of Chicago there. Okay, there's uh, a little bit of uh, tracking in Lake Michigan, uh, just east of Chicago. We have another battery of uh, experiments also that are associated with Earth resources, and uh, they are these cameras that take actual photographs and different wavelengths of light. And then uh, these photographs will then are returned to ground and uh, processed and evaluated. And the purpose, of course, is to learn how to use our resources on Earth more efficiently and more effectively. Handheld cameras were also unstowed. Their lenses aimed at Earth through the wardroom window. Okay, and we got 
got that storm uh, story. It's got a nice viral effect, and uh, it just doesn't look very strong yet. This is Skylab Control at 11 hours 55 minutes Greenwich Mean Time on mission day 10. Today's uh, entire crew schedule is devoted to the extravehicular activity. This was the first of three scheduled okay, EVAs. The amount of work to be performed would make it the longest. I don't know, I've got to check now. Do I have any twist above me, Jack? Uh, nope. Okay, now let me see about this. Erecting a new sunshade over the workshop was their most difficult task. The parasol, deployed from inside by the first crew, had done an adequate job of thermal protection, but temperatures were still high in places, and too, the life of the parasol was questionable. The sunshade would even out workshop temperatures, and it would endure well beyond the final mission. The EVA consumed about double the time allotted, but all tasks were successfully performed. The total time outside the workshop was six and a half hours, a new record for orbital EVA. Temperatures began to fall before the day ended. They eventually stabilized at around 75 degrees, providing the best environment in the workshop since it was launched. The following day, the Apollo telescope mount was put into manned operation, allowing quick and accurate pointing of the telescope array at current solar phenomena. Now, to begin with, when I switched to the two positions called H-alpha, uh, these words stand for hydrogen alpha, and they are called hydrogen because the light that we see comes from light radiated by hydrogen atoms in the sun's uh, atmosphere. Now, this light is in the visible wavelength range, and you can actually see these things, uh, these pictures on the ground as well. They're about the only instruments that we have of that nature. And uh, we use them here because we see much of the fine detail on the sun at these wavelengths radiated by the hydrogen atoms. For example, we can see sunspots, we can see network, uh, we can see filaments, all of these things on the sun in great detail. Now, the next display that I'd like to discuss briefly is a white light coronagraph. Now this coronagraph also records or images pictures in the visible part of the wavelength, but it has a very unique feature which makes it uh, something that cannot be observed very often from the ground. And this is, it has some occulting discs out in front of the telescope so that the center of the image, the, the disc of the sun, is blotted out and all we see is a very faint light coming in from the solar corona. Now, those of us on the ground can only see this at those very infrequent intervals when we have a total eclipse of the sun. Now up here, we're essentially looking at a total solar eclipse all day long. And we monitor the changes that occur in the corona. And once we tie all of our uh, pretty missions together here in Skylab, we will have monitored the changes that occur in the solar corona over a period of over five months. And some of the changes indeed. Uh, we have, as a matter of fact, recorded some very large transients that occurred in the solar corona. A large bubble of gas was blown outward through the solar corona. It stretched the magnetic field lines out like rubber bands and finally burst the rubber bands and the gas continued far on out into the corona and eventually reached the environment of the Earth. Now when these uh, gas bubbles uh, do reach the environment of the Earth, they cause some very interesting things which we can see, or you can see, uh, on the ground. Aurora are one of the most fascinating things that are produced uh, by the arrival of uh, these uh, clouds of gas and magnetic field disturbances. And uh, when they arrive and perturb the Earth's magnetic field, um, in some way not fully understood, uh, uh, the uh, auroras are produced. Dr. Garriott went on to explain instruments that record in the extreme ultraviolet and instruments that provide data in the X-ray wavelengths. And he talked about that interesting phenomena we call solar flares. Flares, for example, are some of the most outstanding transients. Uh, we've had the good fortune to see several of these since we've been up here in the last four weeks. 
And uh, when these events occur, we very quickly go over and train all of our instruments on those players and uh, begin taking photographs as rapidly as possible in as many wavelengths as is possible. And we hope to better understand uh, what produces these flares, uh, what is the size uh, of the flare, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, better understand the mechanism by which these things are produced. Skylab telescopes also reached out beyond our sun to record the ultraviolet spectra of distant star fields. Early type stars, too faint to be seen with the naked eye, were photographed. As were the abundance of young, hot stars in the Milky Way. In conjunction with this experiment were two student investigations designed to obtain ultraviolet spectral data from known pulsars and quasars. In related stellar studies, other instruments were activated to provide a panoramic view and measure ultraviolet brightness of a large number of stars. In evaluating the requirements for future manned space flights, high priority is placed on a machine that will allow an astronaut to move freely in space. Such a machine is the Astronaut Maneuvering Unit, here being flight tested by Alan Bean. Now he's going to fly around those ring lockers. Maneuvering unit is quite reliable, quite easy to fly. As you know, uh, I believe this is me flying it here, and then Jack flew it some, and we wanted to... Uh, Ask Owen to fly it since he had gone through none of the training. And he got in there and flew it just as well as uh, either of us with the minimum of training and uh, it's just the on the job training up there. Kind of gave you a feeling that uh, this sort of a maneuvering unit could be built where uh, pre flight uh, training would be minimized and uh, yet you could still do the job you wanted to do outside. A foot-controlled maneuvering unit was later tested, but in its present configuration, it got rather low marks in performance. A free, uh, free maneuver. The future design that will shuttle astronauts between spacecraft or from spacecraft to satellite will likely be similar to the hand-operated model. In web building, Arabella was getting a handle on zero-g. The adult minnows, meanwhile, were still confused about which way was up or down. But strangely enough, their children, recently hatched aboard Skylab, came into the world without ever having to adapt to zero G. Will body motions of crewmen affect attitude and control of a space vehicle? This question was put to the test in a series of crew vehicle disturbance runs. Okay, they just jumped off the wall, and you can see the skirts rather clearly on the ATM monitor. It was uh, probably an arc minute or so. They're jumping back, and you can see the excursion up and down on the monitor quite clearly. A force measuring system, which senses loads applied to the workshop, is matched with concurrent control system data to find the answers. The tests will clear up many uncertainties about crew motion effects and will influence the design of spacecraft of tomorrow. The subject of attitude and control became a more immediate concern during the second scheduled EVA. Skylab's rate gyro system which instructs the computer as to the amount of attitude drift, had a faulty gyro package. Jack Lausma would install a new one. Okay, Bruce, uh, I'm down here looking at WCIU with all these connectors, and I uh, just got the uh, victim loose. Okay, in a few minutes, uh, the good Lord willing and the creek don't rise, we're going to have this hooked up. 
The package was installed and placed online. Within minutes, the results were in. And for the CDR and telemetry, the six-pack is looking good. The gyros are matching each other. Good news, and now I'm going to power up the uh, CMG again. The EVA lasted four and a half hours. All tasks were successfully performed. Early next day, the crew set a record for the longest manned space flight. They had already traveled 11 and a half million miles. What's more, productivity was at an all-time high. They were now running well ahead of schedule and even requesting jobs to increase the daily workload. One such task was the behavior of bubbles in zero-g. And we will uh, try to cause some perturbations to it again. Now, you see, the oscillations uh, are much less damped, and uh, it exhibits almost all of the three modes of oscillation that you would expect for uh, um, more or less a ball of liquid like that. We'll spin up those oscillations again by just blowing an air jet on the bubble. Okay, there, it's freely floating. There were also demonstrations of angular momentum, magnetic effects, a Wilberforce pendulum. There was even an attempt to find out about the aerodynamics of a paper airplane without gravity. Another uh, set of experiments that we have on Skylab uh, is to uh, explore the industrial uses of space. Here before you have a, uh, an electron beam welding gun. That doesn't look like a welding gun that we have on Earth, but it's a... Uh, operated by uh, high intensity or high energy beam of electrons which will strike uh, metallic uh, material in this chamber which can be evacuated and it's uh, capable of melting the metal you know welding two pieces together additionally uh, with this uh, chamber and the electric beam gun we can uh, produce uh, perfect spheres or ball bearings so uh, grow crystals in here as you know perhaps uh, much of metallurgy and uh, crystal growth the formation of metals is very dependent upon gravity. We believe that we can grow perfect crystals and, uh, and perfect metals without the uh, presence of gravity, and we're examining that particular phenomenon here in Skylab. While most of the time was devoted to experimentation, a part of the astronauts' day was spent on the more mundane aspects of living. There were meals to prepare, cleaning, taking out the garbage, equipment repairs, personal hygiene, and always the exercise. Although a few hours away from the routine was rare, it usually found expression in the novelty of zero G. In September, it became apparent that the rescue mission would not be flown. 
Analysis had shown that command module alternate control modes were more than adequate for deorbit, and the condition had remained stable. In addition, contingency plans were defined for the defective quad thrusters in the unlikely event they would be required. It looked like a nominal mission all the way. Skylab cameras, meanwhile, maintained a steady flow of pictorial data, such as Earth's horizon air glow. These photos will tell scientists about the behavior of ozone and its importance to the thermal balance of the atmosphere. For the science of meteorology, strong weather systems were closely documented. as were these very striking wind convection patterns. Volcanoes? They were photographed around the world to perhaps form a basis for predicting volcanic activity. The Alps, the Straits of Magellan, Italy, Gibraltar, Washington, Baltimore, the Grand Canyon, Cape Cod, the drought area of Africa. From handheld and Earth resources cameras, our planet was photographically documented as never before. September 25th, mission day 60. And for this mission, time had about expired. Houston, AOS, Canarvin, seven minutes. We are docked on time, we're moving away. We indicated about three tenths of a foot per second separation velocity. We're getting ready to run the uh, RCS check. Very good, Al, and uh, we'll be watching. Seems like we're leaving home, Bob. Recovery would be off Southern California by the USS New Orleans. Skylab, the uh, bird looks super to us. Your goal for deorbit and entry. Good news. We're ready to go ourselves. We'll see you uh, on the ground, I guess. This is our last comp. After two months and some 24 million miles, the scientific journey had ended. They were home, back in Earth's gravitational pole. Subjective feeling, I think, was uh, one where uh, your legs feel strong enough and it doesn't feel like it's too heavy to move your body around. But uh, I think your lateral balance is sort of funny. It's, we didn't seem to have much problem with uh, wanting to pitch forward or backwards. It was mostly the sideways uh, correction. 
It would take a couple of days for the crew to regain their steadiness, a normal part of the readaptive process. Many hours of medical tests would follow in which all data would be within normal limits. Long-term medical effects would take several weeks to analyze. But for now, they felt well. Their spirits were high, and they looked forward to home and family. I didn't know we had so many friends. I'm glad to see you all here today. Reunion took place at Houston's Ellington Air Force Base amid welcome home ceremonies. Just as they will for many months to come, the crew attempted to share some of their experiences. Experiences out of which a store of knowledge was gleaned that will shed new light on our troubled planet. And experiences that have served as a proving ground for the next Skylab mission and for our future course in space. Man is in space right now. He's in space to stay. He will always be in space in the future. So the business we're in at the moment right now is trying to develop the abilities to carry out uh, these uh, explorations and advancements that are sure to come. It may not be five years from now or 10 or 15, but if we could all return to the Earth a thousand years from now, we'd find that there are many people here but there are people that have gone from this Earth to the other planets of the solar system, and uh, perhaps even the other stars. We've embarked upon a uh, most fantastic journey, and it will never end. 